we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior. His name, of course, is Jesus Christ. Amen. I love the words. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Great words. Those are Paul's words to the church at Philippi, Colossae, um, Galatia, Ephesus. But it's especially to the point when he preaches here in Galatians. And he gives an introduction. He not only says grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he says in the first verse. Who gave himself for our sins to to rescue us from this present age. According to the will of God the Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He put a little bit extra on there. By the way, when you hear Paul's epistles and when he begins with grace and peace to you, let me just remind you of some great theological things. The word grace, and that is the umbrella. That is our foundation. That is what God has given us. He has graced us with the forgiveness of sins through his son and the the resurrection of his son for our salvation. Grace is the fundamental word. Peace is the result. So when you hear grace and peace to you, grace is fundamental and peace is the result. The order can never be reversed. That's the way it works. You don't say peace to you and grace, you say grace to you and peace. From, there's another great word, from. From conveys the idea that grace and 
peace flow from above, lavished down on us, smothered, the blood of Jesus Christ splattered all over us. So this morning, grace and peace to you from our God and Father, Jesus Christ. Don't be gullible. Let's talk about that. Anybody here gullible? Yeah, right. I think all of us a little bit are gullible. The church militant, that is the church established on this earth. Those of us who are still living, this Christian church on earth, who still undergoes the persecution of the world, of our sinful flesh, that's the church militant. But then you also remember have what? The church triumphant. Those who have gone to heaven. Those who did confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Those people who are now with Jesus Christ in heaven. But the church militant is faced with all kinds of challenges from an unbelieving world. If you worshipped with us last week, we talked about the demonic world. That the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. And his goal is to seek you out and destroy you spiritually. Amidst all of that, how does the church live in the midst of all of these challenges? I, I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that we had to lock church doors. Or I never thought that we'd have to watch out for protesters. We were put on red alert today. The churches from Homeland Security. Churches, watch out. There's going to be people praying around. In opposition of what came out on Friday from the Supreme Court. How does a church live in that kind of society? How do we as believers continue to stand firm? And this is really a subject that we need to continue to, to refresh ourselves in. We need to talk about this because we need to be vigilant. We are the church militant. We do stand up for Jesus Christ and Him alone as Savior. We do acknowledge that there are morals in our society. That God himself has ordained morals, biblical morals. And that we just can't pick and choose the way we see fit. Our text today provides admonitions, it provides warnings, and it provides encouragements from Paul to the church at Galatia. All right, put that on the back shelf just for a little bit. Concerning being gullible, they came out with a new Bible. It's an emoji Bible. Have you heard about this thing? It's an emoji Bible. Now, before I get into this rant a little bit, um, there are many translations. The ESV, the NIV, the RSV, the King James, the New King James. Uh, there, there's great translations. And I suppose if you go to... Apple iBooks for $2.99 and you buy an emoji, an emoji Bible, which I'm not going to do. And if you look at it just for fun, okay. But this Bible was intended for millennials. Now I thought, would have thought it would have been a generation after millennials or even a generation after this. But it's intended for you millennials to give you a 21st century update which is going to convey the great gospel of Jesus Christ with an emoji. Don't be gullible. Do not base your belief on emojis. It's, it's as if in our world today, you package it correctly and properly, people buy it. Hook, line, and sinker. You know, we're easily fooled. People are very, very gullible. And it almost seems like it doesn't take much for people to be fooled. We hear of these and we see these televangelists who are, that, are, that are saying these wild, wild. There, there's some good ones, but there's some bad ones. I almost said something else I shouldn't have said. 
And we are sucked into it at times. People will believe anything that is told them, regardless of common sense. Just present it correctly, package it properly, and everything's good. Our society's gullible. Because there's always someone out there in our society who is willing to help you believe what you want to believe. If you want to believe something, there's somebody out there who is going to cater to your needs. Concerning abortion. I'm going to hit this a few times because that's current in the news. There is and there are churches in our own community who will give you what you need concerning abortion. And will say to you, it is absolutely okay. God would not tell somebody they shouldn't do that. That's a mean God. There's churches who are going to give you that. We hear of a better way of health and wealth. We hear of a better way to live. We hear of a better way to fulfillment. We also hear of a better way to God. And unfortunately, there's no place, unfortunately, no place like religion for supporting quacks and crackpots, honestly. For throwing money at gurus and false Preachers, maybe you know some of them. These false preachers who will look at you and give you new news, a new way to look at the Bible. Amidst a Bible that was never lost in the first place. I've had people, many people, come to my office and say, you know, we didn't like what you preached on Sunday. God wouldn't do that to a group of people. God wouldn't tell a group of people you shouldn't do this. And pastor, by the way, I found a church down the road. And that pastor told me that it's okay what I'm doing. So there you go. That's his theology and it's good enough for me. I'm going I'm to leave the church. That's going on. And quite frankly... It is destroying Christianity. It is destroying the inerrant, inspired Word of God. And this is no new phenomenon. Ask St. Paul. He writes to the Galatians. Look at verse 6. Let's start with that. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You see, Paul's tone changes dramatically. He goes through this long greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father. He talks about the forgiveness of sins. He talks about giving glory to God. And then, boom, right away in verse 6, he said, I'm astonished at what you're doing. Admonishment, he gives them rebuke, he gives them caution. And it sets the stage for what follows. The Galatians have been turning away, and that pushes Paul to extreme action. And he says in here, so quickly. Now that could mean since their conversion, or so quickly since Paul had left the church and gone on to another church. Then he uses these two words. He says, a different gospel. Different gospel does not indicate that there is a different gospel, as Paul makes very clear in verse 7. Verse 7, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, there's a gospel message being proclaimed among Galatians that is not the gospel that Paul taught them. It was not the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified and risen for their salvation. And the Galatians are turning and being led astray from Christ. And Paul has extreme concern for the congregation. So you see, Paul knew all about those guys and those gals who claimed new breakthroughs in Christianity. He knew all about those guys that claimed that Scripture is outdated, even back then, 2,000 years ago, and that Scripture was, was incomplete. 
He knew all about those guys who had a new discovery concerning God's purpose, God's purpose for you, and how you get to heaven. And he knew that these guys, these false preachers, were active in that day. Look at verse 8. Paul said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And he, and he hits the nail on the head by repeating it again, verse 9. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. That's why in this church, we're very careful on what we preach and teach. We use the word of God. We convey what the gospel is. We give that to you every week in this church. And if you don't hear the gospel, you have every right in the world to form a group in the voters' assembly and boot my behind out of here. That's how it works. And I honestly cannot believe that some churches are putting up with this. Some denominations are voting things into power, into their constitutions that are an abomination to God. And especially they're obliterating the gospel. So Paul says to the Galatians and to us, I cannot believe you're being fooled by all of this. Do not be taken in. You see, there's always people who are going to try and convince you that they've discovered something new. And there's churches who are telling their members, we've discovered a different way to come to Jesus. We've discovered a different way to please God. We've discovered, we're going to use some false doctrine, but we've discovered a different way to build a church. We're going to discover a different way to believe and live. And you know what? They sound very convincing, and it all sounds good on the surface. But listen, when you start to peel away all the layers of the rhetoric, you find that it always requires them tweaking the gospel, and you don't tweak the gospel. A little change here, a little change there, a little nip and tuck there. Some theological plastic surgery over here, and poof, there you got it. A different gospel. And people didn't even see it coming. They're being duped. Denominations are being duped. You know any church like that? Verse 6 again. Let's go back. I am astonished that you are so quickly turning to a different gospel. Any change in the gospel is no gospel. Change in the gospel destroys the gospel. Right? Amen? Change in the gospel destroys the gospel. Do not be duped. FYI, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, the members hear it every week, but if you're visiting with us for the first time, let me tell you how we in this church see Through scripture, great theology, how we preach, how we comprehend cognitively in the brains that God Almighty has given us, let me convey to you the biblical gospel. Here it is. God in his mercy sent his son in the flesh into the sinful world. Jesus then did what? He took the burden of the sin and he went to a cross. Then what did he do? He suffered and he died. Then what had happened? He paid the price. God the Father damned his son to hell for you. That's the full literal gospel. You ever heard anybody say that before? God the Father damned his son on the cross for you. To fulfill the law that we are unable to fulfill. And he rescued us and he redeemed us from sin and death. Jesus then was laid into a tomb. He rose from the dead on the third day. And so shall we rise. He ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of power and the Father. And now forgiveness, life, and salvation are ours in Jesus Christ. 
All of this he does out of fatherly and divine goodness with which none of us here deserve. But he does it anyway because of grace and peace in that order. Here's a picture for you. This is how it works in the church. Kind of blurry, but you get the point. The cross is where it was won. These are where it is delivered. Word and sacrament. The Bible, baptism, and communion. Even a kid can understand that. Kids, can you understand that? You're given the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word and baptism and communion. That's it. There's only one gospel of Jesus Christ. But my human logic can't figure it out. Why would God act this way? I'm not going to believe that. That's a different gospel. But that guy's book that I read, I'm giving you all a bunch of examples that I've heard. That guy's book that I read, I don't understand it, but I know that I'm a child of God because of what I do. That's a different gospel. My neighbor says that I have to speak these words that I don't understand and that baptism doesn't count. That's a different gospel. My neighbor says that we have to, as Christians, be tolerant of all kinds of behavior in our society because God is love and he is tolerant of everybody and what they do. Bull. That's a different gospel. Don't be fooled, people. There's only one gospel. It's Jesus Christ on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. The gospel of Jesus Christ as God's plan, not man's plan. God says this is the way it's going to work. You really think we're almighty enough to stand up and give our version of the gospel? It's not a matter of man. It's a matter of God choosing to save man. And by the way, let me tell you this. It is God's plan. Not so much to please man, but to save man. Now, don't get bombarded by that. His goal is not for you to sit back and to be happy with everything that he does. Because we're not. His goal is to save you and to prepare a place for you. That's his plan. And he hopes that you are pleased with his grace and his mercy and his peace. That's what we're pleased with. Look at verse 10, and I'm going to wrap it up. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. By the way, that uh, word in verse 10, the last line, servant, that's dolus. That does not mean a it is translated slave. It does not mean one that has to do hard labor here in the Greek, but it means one who is obedient. So you could read it, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be Christ. When you try to please people other than God, you are not obedient to Christ. And so you see two questions here. He has two questions. The first question is in regard to God, and the second question is in regard to people. And the second question makes the first question very clear. My job, I, you, we in the church want to please God because he has first pleased us. Do not be fooled. And often we are led astray by the gospel and something looks at us and we say, that almost makes sense. Turn around, walk away, and walk back to the word. Walk back to your baptism. Walk back to communion. Remember those things. That's why it's called the means of grace. That's why it's called the means by which we're saved. All these other things sound so tempting. They sound at times logical. They sound at times so easy, so fulfilling. And then off we go. But it leads to destruction. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, snatched you out of the jaws of hell and death. And opened the gates of everlasting life forever. 
Amen? That's it. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let's rise for prayer. Have a great week.